the original Call of Juarez showed a lot of promise, but was definitely rough around the edges. What? How? How did something fail? Like, what failed me? And now I have to fight this guy again? And then the game crashed on me. Nice! Like, very rough. Bound in Blood, however, is an improvement over the first game in every way possible. I didn't think it would be possible to make a duel more annoying than the first game, but they managed. Mostly. Hey everyone, Jarek the Gaming Dragon here. If you're already subscribed and you haven't clicked that bell, be sure to do that, otherwise YouTube won't tell you that I posted anything. If you haven't subscribed, well, watch this video and maybe consider subscribing if you like it. Call of Juarez Bound in Blood is a prequel, meaning it takes place before the original Call of Juarez, which I'm totally okay with. In the original Call of Juarez, they occasionally mention Reverend Ray McCall's past. They acknowledge it, but Ray doesn't seem to want to talk about it. He wants to sweep it under the rug and move forward with his life. At the time, I thought it was just kind of a backstory to explain why Reverend Ray McCall is such a badass that could slaughter people by the dozens. But Bound in Blood fully explains this past. It follows the journey between Ray McCall, Thomas McCall, who was Billy's stepfather, and William McCall, all brothers. The journey starts in the Civil War. Already, Ray's past starts to make more sense. No wonder he can murder people he fought in a war. Ray and Thomas are on the Confederate side. And very early on in Act 1, you have a choice. Stay and fight for the Confederate Army, or go and protect your home and your family. Ray and Thomas both desert the army and go protect their home. They're unfortunately too slow, their mother dies, but their younger brother survives. That said, this royally pisses off the colonel, who wanted their army to pull back and help defend something. This something they were trying to defend was protecting Atlanta. Apparently, they failed, and Atlanta was burned to the ground, which also resulted in the death of this colonel's family. The colonel is pissed off by this and seeks revenge on everyone that deserted the Confederate army. That's only Act 1. The rest of it is kind of your standard Western. It becomes a journey with Ray, Thomas, and William across the West and into Mexico. I'm not going to explain everything that happens in the story. You're not going to be getting any spoilers. I feel like it would be much better if you played it yourself, and there's way too much to talk about here. Having too much to talk about in a video is always better than not having enough. This game really packs a lot of content in its story. But the gist is that William, the younger brother, is a priest and is not happy with how Ray and Thomas are evolving. They slowly devolve into becoming outlaws, and Ray seems to not care, Thomas slowly following after. Their antics become more and more ridiculous throughout the game, and they find people that are less and less... Well, you just kind of don't want to know the people they're starting to become associated with. There's a lot of conflict with a lot of characters, good and bad, you meet throughout the course of the game. They all have their own unique character arcs, and they're all voice acted extremely well. Well, except for the Native American ones, but I almost feel like they were doing this intentionally to fit the old spaghetti western theme. Maybe I'm reading too far into that, but it didn't necessarily bother me that much. You'll start to like and dislike characters throughout the game, and these are both good things. When you dislike a character, it's not because they're just annoying. They're written well, and you probably should dislike them. Or maybe you just dislike the character in the moment because of whatever conflict has popped up. But throughout the entire game, I just couldn't dislike them. They stayed amusing and so interesting, especially Ray McCall. That treasure is nothing but a fairy tale. There's only one decent way for God-fearing people to make their fortune. With hard work and sacrifice. Or, we can find some rich son of a bitch and put a gun to his head. You're drunk. I'm getting there. Ray, if you kill him, you'll be just like him. And you will burn for all eternity. Look, I've had just about enough of your fire and brimstone, boy. If what you say is true, it's too late for me anyway. It's not too late. It's not. When our Savior was nailed to the cross, there were two other men crucified alongside of him. Murderers. And he took one of them to heaven because that man repented. He begged for forgiveness. And he was forgiven. The Lord forgave him? Yes. A cold-blooded murderer? Yes. Well, hell. That's good to know. Again, I am leaving a lot of information out here. The story is something I don't want to spoil, and there's just too much to talk about in this format. 
So if you're someone that plays a game for the story, I really would recommend this game. You'll be entertained the entire game by the constant barking back and forth between Thomas and Ray. As for graphics, this is another case where the game simply just looks better in every single way than the first game. I feel like there's a little bit of an asterisk though. The original Call of Juarez was one of the very first games to use DirectX 10, and as such, it was kind of ahead of the curve in many ways. Found in Blood released in 2009, and at this point everyone caught up. It wasn't really ahead of the curve in any ways, but for 2009 it's still a pretty good looking game, and was one of the better looking games of that year. Certainly not the best, but a sizable improvement over the first game. Textures are clearer, particle effects are more prevalent, like dust and smoke, and look better than the first game. Depth of Field makes the game look better and fit the spaghetti western. Depth of the Field might annoy some people occasionally, but in this game, it just sort of fits and never got on my nerves. Water looks a lot better in Bound of Blood, as that was one of the weaknesses in the original Call of Juarez. Things like reloading animations look a lot better than the original game, but as a whole, animations are still Bound of Blood's main weakness. They don't look terrible, but they definitely aren't up to snuff compared to other games of its time. They're not entirely jarring though, and the game is smooth enough to where you likely won't notice this. As for the PC port, it's pretty smooth. Unlike the first game, I didn't have any crashing issues whatsoever. In fact, I streamed this game for 7.5 straight hours without one crash. All the options you'd expect to be in a PC release are in this release, and the game looks pretty smooth because of it. It's only missing one thing. Just like the first game, there's no FOV slider, which is puzzling, because the FOV in this game is not very good. Now before you become that guy that comes into my comments and goes, NO ONE CARES, STOP TALKING ABOUT THE FOV, just Google Call of War's Bound and Blood FOV. Yeah, a lot of people care. The FOV in this game was pretty narrow. Thankfully with the help of a realism mod, changing your FOV is very easy. You don't actually have to install the realism mod or use it in any way although it's worth looking into if you have played this game before. Instead, you only need one file from this mod, data0.pack. It's a drag and drop, you replace the old file, and there you go, you got a new FOV. The default FOV is... lacking, to say the least. This game uses a vertical FOV, and the vertical FOV by default is 46, which means you have 73 horizontal FOV. Not good. You have three options with this mod. You have 57 vertical FOV, which equates to 87, this is a little too narrow for me. You have 65 vertical, which equates to 97, this is about perfect and what I use. And then you have 75, which equates to 107, which is a little too much. Once you've replaced these files, you don't have to do anything else, you just have the higher FOV. What's bizarre about this is that these don't break the game at all. The animations all work as intended. So it's a little weird that they didn't just include an FOV slider like they should have. It didn't cause any problems, so I don't see why not. Regardless, once you change the FOV, you won't have to think about this again. The game just works as intended, and everything else that should be in a PC release is there. So as a PC release, it's pretty good. Like everything else in this video, the gameplay is better in every single way. Almost. I'll get to that in a moment. Much like the first game, you play between two different characters. However, unlike the first game, you don't have different routes and different levels. You just have the choice between playing as Ray or Thomas. Ray is the more up-close, in-your-face gunslinger type. I found that with him, the best things to use are the revolvers and a shotgun. Thomas, however, is more of a sharpshooter. Rifles are more his thing, and he can't do wield revolvers. But he is more accurate. He also has a lasso to reach higher places. Thankfully, this lasso isn't as annoying to use as the first game, but I still have a little bit of a pet peeve with it. This game loves gimmicky controls. For example, with the lasso, if you want to grab onto something, you hold down the left mouse click and spin your mouse around. Why? In real life, what you're doing is multiple actions for one result. But in a video game, you're pointing and clicking to do one thing. It's one action in-game. That should correlate to one input. Not a bunch of spinning your mouse around crap. I hate that. It reminds me back when Six Axis was a brand new thing and every developer wanted to somehow shove it into their game for no damn reason. Like say Killzone 2, holding down the triggers and turning the controller to turn a valve. Just let me hold a button down. Anyway, I shouldn't be too harsh on this because it's definitely a big improvement over the first game where the platforming sections were downright awful. In this game, they at least mostly work. Although it can be a little bit tricky and finicky, it's still, still a big improvement over the first one. Anyway, back on topic. Thomas is a more agile character. He can climb on platforms, use his lasso. In general, they play very differently. However, this game has no co-op, which I find to be very strange. Levels are generally just a choice between one character or the next, and you have both brothers on the level at all times. So you could have easily put co-op with one player playing as Ray and one playing as Thomas. But there's no co-op anywhere here. It's a really big missed opportunity. I'm still not complaining too much because having that option is nice and it's going to boil down to which one fits your natural playstyle more than the other. 
I preferred Ray because I generally like getting up close to people and his playstyle fit me better, but I still alternated between the different characters because it adds a nice variety to the gameplay. The game is mostly linear and straightforward, however it does let you go at your own pace for most of the game. Occasionally there are scripted sequences that force you to hurry up, but these rarely got annoying to me. This is my favorite kind of a linear campaign. Take something like Half-Life. It's obvious where you need to go, but there's nothing trying to force this false sense of urgency to push you forward. It lets you play the game at your own pace, how you want to do it. The combat feels nice and punchy, the guns are enjoyable, although it's kind of lacking the crazy ragdoll from the first one, which is understandable as maybe a little too over the top in the first game. The characters also have more added gimmicks. As I mentioned, Thomas has his lasso, but he also has some other options. You can use a bow and arrow for more stealth kills, or even throwing knives that are actually surprisingly useful. The game never tells you you can use these, so I went about halfway through the game not using them. And then I tried them and found that they almost lock onto the target, and holy crap, these are good! If you've never played this game before, use the knives, they're really useful. As for Ray, like I said he can do wield, but he can also throw dynamite, which Thomas cannot do. Stealth is also just not really an option with him. If you're choosing Ray, you're going in guns blazing. But the biggest difference between these two characters is their concentration mode. In the first game you had this sort of bullet time mechanic, where if you holstered your guns and then clicked, you would pull both your guns out and your crosshairs would come together slow motion, and you can kill anyone during this time. They changed this up in Bound in Blood. When you kill an enemy, it adds to a meter in the top right. Once that fills up, you can use your concentration mode. For Ray, this means time almost comes to a complete stop, you can look around and tag targets you want to kill, and then you shoot them all one after another, and it looks badass. For Thomas, when you use his concentration mode, you hold down left click and drag back on your mouse, which will snap from target to target. I assume pulling back on the mouse is supposed to simulate pulling back the hammer like when you're fanning a revolver, but if you don't have enough mouse pad space, it's kind of annoying to do this. I do have one big complaint with concentration mode though. When you fill up that meter in the top right, you have 60 seconds to use it. Why? Why can't I just store it and use it when I need it? I assume they're trying to encourage me to use it more, but a lot of times I just want to keep it for when 5 or 6 enemies pop out at me, because that's inevitably going to happen, and then concentration mode would be perfect and be incredibly satisfying to use. But I just used it 30 seconds earlier because I would have lost it if I didn't. A lot of times those enemies that pop out at you all at once are what gives you your concentration mode and then you only use it on the one or two enemies left over. It's still visually appealing and an awesome, fun mechanic to have, I just kind of wish that limit wasn't there. In the first game, there was a manual leaning system. Press Q to lean left, E to lean right. Basic, but pretty useful. In this game, they tried to add a contextual leaning system that just doesn't work as well. You walk up to cover, and you automatically take cover. By moving your mouse up, down, or left and right, you can peek around the wall or lean over cover. This sounds like it should work fine, and it does in the context of you need cover and there's cover in front of you. The problem is, you kind of just get sucked into cover, and since moving your mouse left and right is what you use to actually lean around the wall, a lot of the times you just want to look left and right, and instead it sticks your big fat head out in the way for it to get shot. Thankfully, you can go into the options menu and turn this off, which I did very early on in the game because it was more nuisance than it was anything else. As I said, Bound of Blood is better gameplay-wise than the first game in every way. They managed to remove all the problems, or at least limit all the problems I had with the first one. Some issues did see a return though, like instant failure syndrome. Now this is toned down a lot from the first game, but occasionally it would happen. Usually when the game just kind of suddenly decides you fail, it's because there was a scripted event that's supposed to happen, but nothing blocks you off from walking forward, so if you walk too far away, the game just kind of fails you. Oh god damn it! To make matters worse, the checkpoint problem comes back from the first game. Checkpoints can be real shit and a lot of times happen before exposition. So you can run into a situation like that and then suddenly be thrown back before the last cutscene. Why? Again, I asked what I asked with the first game, why not lock off the ability to move forward if I'm not supposed to move forward yet? Or lock off my ability to go backward instead of just failing me? It's an incredibly easy, simple fix that would remove a huge amount of frustration. But speaking of frustration, we got the big one I need to get out of the way right now, these duels. You might be saying to yourself, wow, that actually looks pretty nice compared to the first game. Unfortunately, gameplay-wise, it's worse in every way. This is the one thing they really faltered on when it comes to the sequel. In the first game, the way the duels worked is that you would drag your mouse down and then back up and shoot the enemies. You had a chance to lean to dodge their bullets. It felt like a mini game. It wasn't a fun one, but at least it was a mini game. In Bound in Blood, these things are basically just quick time events. 
To make matters worse, they really didn't explain these well. All they explained to you is that you press A and D to keep your opponent in sight, and you drag your mouse down and up to shoot your enemy when the bell rings. So of course the first time I try it, I drag my mouse down and back up, and nothing happened. I didn't grab the gun, and then I died. Why? Oh, silly me, I'm supposed to actually drag my mouse down into the left. Effectively, what's going on here is you're controlling your hand, almost like an Old West quap. Yeah, if that doesn't sound fun to you, it's not. You also don't have the ability to lean away from the enemy's bullets. This is literally a glorified quick time event. To make things even worse, this doesn't seem to correlate with your sensitivity in game very well. I had to drag my mouse all the way across my mouse pad to even come close to grabbing the gun. And sometimes it just didn't work. So in order for me to even be able to beat these, I had to raise my DPI as much as possible every time one of these show up. And if you don't grab your gun as soon as that bell rings, you are going to die. There is no way around it. As I said, you can't dodge the bullets. This is literally a quick time event. To make things worse, it takes a while before that bell rings. You're going to fail and then sit there waiting for that bell to ring over and over again. You can't just go again right when the bell rings. And if there is going to be a bad guy in the game, they are going to be killed in a duel. Every single one of them. These happen so often. Fuck the duels! I can tell you exactly what happened here. Someone at Techland had a vision in their mind. How do we get a spaghetti western duel into our video game? How do we visually make it look like a spaghetti western? They put it into the game, and then the playtesters told them, hey, this plays like garbage. And they didn't listen to them because it looks visually nice. What's the most important part of a video game? The video game. What do good developers do when they put time into something that ends up not panning out? They remove it from the game. Get this shit out of the game. It fucking sucks. One of the worst things about this duel system is that it makes no sense. It hits a huge pet peeve of mine of video games where you can eat bullets the whole damn game, but since you're in a cutscene, one bullet's gonna kill you. Why? I just got done gunning down 50 people in a row. This one person is gonna stop me for me to have a duel and then shoot me once and I die? This is like coming first place in a cross country meet, but you have to go to the bathroom the whole time, so you keep sharding yourself all the way through. Yeah, you got first place, but there's a big shit stain down your shorts. What I mean by that is that this game is a really good game, but these duels drag it down a whole grade. There are some annoying things in the rest of the game, sure, I could nitpick about it all day long, but in the end of the day, those things are there because of another mechanic and overall it works well. These duels have no redeeming qualities in any way whatsoever. The duels were so bad that I was actually looking forward to making the voiceover for this video just so I could bitch and rant about them for a solid 5 minutes, which I've probably already done. So I guess I'll just end the video here and remind you that the game as a whole is absolutely fantastic. But man, they dropped the ball on this one mechanic. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed listening to me rant about a mechanic in a video game that ultimately means nothing in my life. If you want to hear me complaining about more things, the next game I'm going to be streaming is Call of War's The Cartel. I know this game is absolutely terrible, so if you want to come join me, my Twitch is twitch.tv slash Derek for Gaming Dragon. People like watching me suffer for some reason. My subscribers on Twitch get to see my videos one day ahead of time. Again, following and subscribing are two totally different things when it comes to Twitch. Same thing goes for my patrons. If you want to check out my Patreon, look in the bottom right of this end card. If you want to watch the rest of my videos, you can click somewhere else on the screen. Screen. Thank all of you guys for watching, and I will see you next time.